Welcome everyone to the Switch for Good podcast. Bienvenidos, welcomen wherever you are listening in the world. We welcome you. I'm Dotsie and I'm so happy you're tuning in. But those of you who listen regularly know that I have a much better half, a co-host, Alexandra Paul. And she is missing today from our wonderful uh, interview with the guest that uh, we're both so excited to have on. She is not here because as many of you might know, because you've been following, she is in Merced County, California, as we speak on trial for rescuing two sick chickens from a foster farm slaughter truck. Jury selection on this case took three full days. So by Friday afternoon, they finally had a jury. And today, literally while we're recording this podcast, Alexandra takes the stand. The stand. So we are sending her all of the incredible uh, good energy that she needs. If you want to tune in, uh, when this airs next week, the trial will be over. But if you want to see the nightly coverage of the trial, Unchained TV has been covering it nightly. Uh, they have a reporter reporting from the courthouse. There's actually a panel of us too. I'm on the panel uh, as Alexandra's advocate, really, uh, just telling her side of the story. Uh, there's multiple attorneys on the panel, um, some activists, some doctors, and uh, it's been it's been really interesting following this. So you can still go to Unchained TV, which is an app on your phone, uh, and you'll be able to watch all of the nights of coverage if you really uh, want to get up to speed on what happened. But next week, Alexandra will hopefully be with us, uh, provided she is not in jail. We feel confident, I will say, uh, just cautiously confident that that she uh, and her co-defendant are going to win. So hopefully they are acquitted and she is with us next week, because I think that we will probably do an entire episode on this entire experience. But as you all know who listen often, she is uh, one of the greatest warriors uh, and defenders of animals on planet Earth. So that's where Alexandra is. But I am crazy stoked to be here, as I mentioned, because we have an awesome, awesome guest in Darcy Gector. For anyone out there who has had the odds stacked against them, which is everyone at some point, right? For anyone who's been told it can't be done or you don't have what it takes, have I got a story for you. Today's Iron Willed guest, Darcy Gector, has been whitewater kayaking for over two decades and is considered one of the best kayakers on the planet. She's won whitewater kayaking races throughout the world, led kayaking expedition in over a dozen countries. And in the year 2013, she became the very first and only woman to kayak the entire Amazon River from its origin in the Andes Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean. In her book, Amazon Woman, Facing Fears, Chasing Dreams, and My Quest to Kayak the Largest River from Source to Sea, Darcy chronicles the arduous 148 day, 4,300 mile journey descending the Amazon, braving everything from sub zero waters to pirates to piranhas to poachers and sand fleas, all while maintaining fidelity to her, that's right, vegan diet, no less. When she isn't venturing into the unknown, you might find her showing other kayakers some of her favorite destinations, devoting her time to an environmental cause or dazzling audiences at public speaking engagements. But it's a real thrill to have her here with us. And she can talk about what it means to find your inner strength, to tap into your unrealized potential and achieve the extraordinary. So welcome, welcome Darcy to the Switch for Good podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And yeah, I can't uh, wait to hear what happens with the trial. It's uh, going to be a very interesting thing to follow. Yes, very much so. And, you know, since, since you're learning about it a week before everyone, all of our listeners, um, we will be on tonight if you want to tune into Unchained TV because you'll be able to find out uh, kind of what went down. Alexandra will come out of court probably about five Pacific and she usually comes on camera and kind of gives us a, an update. So, Oh, great. Yeah. My sister has rescued chickens before off those trucks. So she will be very interested to hear too. Oh, most definitely. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So tell, tell her to tune in. She'll, she'll, she'll know. She'll know yeah. what Alexandra went through and her, and her co-defendant Alicia. Um, but gosh, I said to you before we, before we went live that I feel like I've been living under a rock because I didn't find your story until, 
uh, last fall and you were very busy because we, I think it was in November and, and, and here you are in March. Like we had to book way, way ahead, <laughs> but it's just, it's just one of those just magical stories uh, that is so moving uh, to hear. I've watched a lot of your, of your interviews. Um, and it, and it, it's a story, although not everyone has kayaked the Amazon river, everyone on planet earth has dealt with, um, a lot of the frustrations and challenges that you talk about on, on your journey. One, I just have to start with, I, I saw this Kind of question that came up a lot in your in your, in your interviews. Many people um, questioned, and uh, you said that many th people thought it was a inappropriate endeavor. But I never heard any deeper conversation about that. So I I want to start with you know just really facing all odds, right? What in the world is that about, or was that about? What what was meant by that? Yeah, it's a it is sort of a weird comment and I don't I don't know what they really meant about it you know it's like I guess the biggest thing that I feel in feedback is people just look at me and just automatically assume that I couldn't do something like expedition kayaking or or a first you know that it's hard to do something that no one else has done in this day and age and so they I just look very much like an unlikely adventurer. And, and I was older too, I was 35 when we did the trip. And so I think it's kind of a combination of all those things. It doesn't exactly fit into people's normal ideas about what an expedition member should look like, or yeah, I think it's, yeah, to me, it's just a problem of uh, <clears throat> not fitting into a nice, neat way that our brains can organize information in the world that we get to see. But that's, that's kind of like become my whole mission is to shake that up and show people that their normal ways of thinking about things aren't necessarily the only way to think about things and people can surprise you sometimes. Yeah, one of those ways is just to not think about them, right? Because people told you you were too little or too short or because you're a woman and I'm, I'm assuming you didn't take any of that in. Right, I mean, it's that's, I feel very fortunate that for some reason, my entire life, when when I've gotten that sort of feedback from people, I I can't say that it hasn't affected me because certainly it has. But I've never once thought, oh, they're right. I'm not going to try to do this. I've just gotten mad at them and thought more like, OK, I got to prove these people wrong. You know, that's been my gut reaction rather than shying away and thinking, oh, maybe they're right. So I do feel fortunate in that regard, but it's still it's obviously been annoying and it's helped me yeah. a little bit because it's, it's like it's human nature to judge people. And, and I'm guilty of that too. I look at someone mm -hmm. and I make my judgments, but it's my own experiences have really helped me try to reel myself in on my own judgments. Like, okay, don't let's just do your judging. That's fine. And then set that aside and let this person show me who they really are. And so that's been mm -hmm. kind of one good thing that has come out of being annoyed by other people, I guess. Right. I love that you found something good to come out of being annoyed by other people because it's, <laughs> it's hard to do. Uh, you really, uh, you speak in kind of an, a, a, an unrelenting way that the first step to doing anything great is this unwavering belief that it can be done, which I'm sure helps you shut out those naysayers that, right. you know, you just, you just, you have that. Um, and you said, oh, I, nothing special, that you're really just, a, I think you said a stubborn brat who doesn't yes. like to be told. <laughs> so that, that you don't like to be told that you can't do things. <clears throat> right. And, and, and that is, it's idealistic. You know, when, when I heard that, I thought, oh gosh, you know, it's like, it would, I would love to just feel like that was part of the fiber of my being. Um, were you born that way or did this feeling develop over time? Yeah, that's a good question that I've really spent a lot of time thinking about in various interviews and, mm -hmm. and working on projects like this and how to teach other people how to feel that way. And I still don't really know the answer, you know, from like some of my earliest memories, like my parents gave me a skateboard for my eighth birthday. 
And the neighbor boy came out and said, like, girls can't skateboard, you know, what are you doing with that thing? And even at that age, I remember just thinking, like, screw that kid, I gotta go out here and prove that I can do this. And so certainly for from a young age, I felt that way. Um, I did in my own family life, kind of learn early on to be very independent. And this isn't necessarily a good thing, but really learn to take the attitude of like, I don't need anybody's help. I've got to do everything on my own. And that has kind of been a bit detrimental, honestly, later in life. But I think that that attitude was part of what helped me not listen to other people and just think, okay, I've got to figure out a way to get this done. And Quite honestly, a lot of it was a bit delusional. Like I definitely could not do everything that I was certain I could do as a young person and now still. But it is helpful to uh, start your project, your task, whatever, with that attitude that like, I know I can get this done. And I've learned many times that I've been wrong about that um, assertion, but it's still really helpful to start a project feeling that way, you know, because it gives you the confidence to try gives you the confidence to work really hard at it. And then when you do fail, it's, for me, it's always been like, okay, well, what do I have to fix to try again? It's not, it's, it has helped failure feel more okay in some weird way. I get that so much, right? Not, like not even, it almost, it's not so much like, okay, I didn't accomplish that thing or whatever the specificness of it was, but I learned this from it. I took this out of it and I'm going to apply it, which is, really the best learning atmosphere anyway is just yeah. falling on your face exactly it, it certainly it sounds like it was like a little bit of both like you it, it was in your dna to fight back and be like oh no little kid with the skateboard <laughs> dude you know but uh but but you know we hone it right as we go we yeah. hone that do, do you it, do you feel like over time did there become a source that you would pull from um, to gather your self-belief or your inner strength when, when something would come up that you're like, ooh, I can maybe try that or maybe I could do that or maybe I could accomplish that? Is there just a, a, anything? Is there a, a, a source, a, a meditative process or something that someone can could learn from this and, and, and apply? Or are you just Darcy and it's like nobody... <laughs> nobody can replicate it no yeah I think it's very easily um reproducible and yeah I think it's for me it's morphed over the years and yeah at the beginning it was just sort of this stubborn determination to do anything anyone told me I couldn't do and that's that's really what started it like I said I think that me calling myself just a stubborn brat was not really an oversimplification I think that was very true when I when I was a kid <laughs> But then, um, you know, like through my teenage years, a lot of it was fueled by anger. And I don't think that that's the best pass, but I was just so pissed mm. off by all these people telling me that I couldn't do everything I wanted to do because I was always short and skinny, but I always liked to play sports and I wanted to be the outside hitter in volleyball and play basketball. And, you know, these people weren't without their reason for telling me that I'm not going to be a successful basketball player, but it still, it just made me so mad that so much of it at that time was fueled just by anger. And then now, and especially in my kayaking career, like when I first started whitewater kayaking, there was one woman that I could think of that I could look up to as like a really good whitewater kayaker. And this was 25 years ago and it, things have changed a lot. There's a lot of really good um, top female athletes now. Mm -hmm. So a lot of choices for role models, but I remember going through my kayaking career, like I have to keep doing this so that I can be a role model for the next person. It was so important to me. This woman's name is Nikki Kelly. It was so important for me to have Nikki when I was having a hard time kayaking, like, no, you know, Nikki can do this. So can I. And so I eventually wanted to be that for someone else. And so it almost became easier when I wasn't doing it for myself anymore. Like if I was really tired or lacking motivation, it's like, you've got to get up Darcy and do this for all the other girls or women or whoever it is that needs, that needs someone to look up to. And that's uh, kind of still where my motivation comes from now. And in, yeah, in a weird way, 
you know, if you have a goal, it's easier to motivate to go training or go do something. Mm -hmm. And now it's just easier for me to do it for the other people somehow. If I'm just going hiking for myself, it's a little bit easier to be lazy. But if it's like, no, I got to keep being this role model, I got to keep being this source of inspiration, even if it's just for one person, it feels like a good, uh, like you were saying, a good source of yeah. strength, of motivation, of a reason to believe in myself and keep going, no matter what anyone says. Yeah, it's a, that is, it is that is a source. It's a, it's a beautiful source, and it's a it's a giving, right? It's a giving back. It's a giving loving source to those who are coming after you who want to break barriers because you you broke a gigantic one, many gigantic ones, in uh you know your your active career. I can really relate to that so much where I just don't, there isn't a single fiber of my being that wants to go to the heights of cycling for me. I mean, I'm a little older than you are, so it's probably also just literally not possible anymore, <laughs> but uh, like grandma, but I feel so much inspiration to keep fit enough that those young girls that want to go for a ride or want to learn, and they're still faster than I am, but you know, just it's, it's all for, for, for them now it feels so different. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it was almost weird when that started bleeding out of me, literally like post Olympics, like I just, and some of it I think is like when you hit a, a, a huge peak, if you're a lot younger, maybe you want to hit many more. I was, older, like you stood on the Olympic podium at at just a couple months shy of my 40th birthday. And it was like, then it just afterwards, it was like, I don't, there's, I have no desire whatsoever in any part of me to try to like, not replicate that or beat it. Like, it was was just kind of like, uh, check, like, wow. So uh, anyway, it's just a, it's a, it's a, I'm, Point with just this in 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 a, a book that I'm writing that's taking 87 million years to finish, but uh, th- just that concept uh, mm-hmm. of, of what we're talking about about source and 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 passing 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 the source torch, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know what you did, winning a medal right before you turned 40, and like last summer, I was the oldest competitor, male or female, at this big kayaking race. Like I think it's. <sighs> important to still, you know, if we're able still be out there showing it. Cause another thing that I think a lot of, a lot of people, but a lot of women more than men here is like, after you're a certain age as a woman, you're very useless, you know? And Mm. so like, no, we're, we're hopefully motivating and inspiring young people too. But I think we're both pretty good sources of inspiration for older people as well. So that's, you know, that makes me happy as well. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So you picked kayaking. You didn't pick volleyball or basketball. You you grew up at altitude. You grew up in Aspen, Colorado. Yeah. And it, and and I I read that you started kayaking after a little bit just right after high school while working as a raft guide. Yes. So because you're Darcy, I mean, you probably could have done volleyball if that is really what you had your heart set on, but you chose kayaking what 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 about it I mean of all the you phenomenal athlete clearly you could have chosen many was there something about kayaking that just that feeling where you just like this is it I think it it was a few things in kayaking Um, it was really hard for me you know kayaking was the first sport that I learned where I wasn't good at it kind of right away and that you know was very surprising. And I was like, what is going on? And so it was like an extra challenge, which I really liked that. But I think what mostly did it for me in my first year of kayaking, um, a friend invited me to go kayaking in Nepal. And I had never left North America before. We went on this kayaking trip to Nepal. We were like way off the beaten path trying to get into these rivers. And it was just such an exciting, eye-opening opportunity, you know, one for the travel possibilities, two, um, you know, we did some things that other tourists did in Nepal, but then we also got to see this contrast of, you know, meeting these people in villages that was like a five-day walk from any road and just getting to 
have this whole other experience that to me felt very special and like that not a lot of people got to do it. And that's what really hooked me on the sport of kayaking. And that's still the kind of kayaking that I like the best. You know, I'm not, I do some kayaking competitions, but I don't like that as much as uh, traveling, getting far away from normal civilization and just seeing what you find out there. Oh, gosh, it's like mesmerizing just listening to you talk about it. It's like, it's like I want to go. <laughs> I think it's so scary. The, 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 the whole one time I went, it was terrifying, but I loved that part of it. Yeah, that the it, that overcoming it, the yeah. fear of it is like, the mental challenge is, is huge and, and fun. Yeah, really incredible, incredible sport. So, you know, going from kayaking and loving it because it's hard and you wanted to conquer that to the Amazon is like a <laughs> large jump. Uh, it, I want to hear about when this first came into your sphere of like, I want to do that. Knowing you, you know, obviously you knew it would be the first woman. What made you pick that? So I, I was going to say earlier, like when you said that I picked kayaking, I, I feel more like kayaking picked mm. me and this Amazon expedition picked me. It, um, it was not my idea. So uh, my, it feels weird to say boyfriend because we've been together for 23 years and um, partner in business, partner in life, but still boyfriend. Um, so my boyfriend and I run a whitewater kayaking business in Ecuador. So we guide kayakers all winter long in Ecuador and then go kayaking on our own all summer long. And we just basically go kayaking all the time. And we had a client come to Ecuador named David Midgley, who his nickname is Midge. I'll call him that. He came and he said, hey guys, I uh, want to kayak the Amazon, but I don't really know how to kayak. So you guys need to teach me to be an expert kayaker so that I can do this thing I want to do. Wow. And he, he's like a very brilliant computer programmer. And he had was having a little bit of a midlife crisis, I think. And he felt <laughs> like he needed one big adventure and that would make him a well-rounded human being. He's like, I don't want to, he loves computer programming, but he's like, I don't want to spend my whole life doing just that. I need one adventurous thing. And then I'll be content to go back to the computer. And he he picked the Amazon because he read a statistic that more people had walked on the moon than had descended the Amazon River from source to sea and that no one had done the whole thing in a kayak. So he said, that that's what I'll do. I'll kayak the Amazon. But when he chose this goal, he truly, like literally had never sat in a kayak before. And so he came and trained with us for 10 years like every winter coming oh. to Ecuador. Yeah. He's like, he's a very How good old was example. he when he came to you guys the first, the first he, time? Said I well, he was 42 when we did the Amazon. So he okay. was 32 when he came. Yeah. And yeah, he's a good example of uh, determination and mm -hmm. patience. Like I don't, I can't really think of many other people who have had such a long range goal and stuck to it, you know, which he did. He became a class five kayaker, which class five is the hardest runnable classification of whitewater. He successfully became a class five kayaker. He, we, Don and I went with him to help him down the Amazon and obviously do it for ourselves too, but he kayaked the whole thing and he, you know, made good on his, on his goal. That and now is a back to computer story. Program. I know. Oh my gosh. Wow. So I remember you talking in some interviews about the group dynamic problems on your expedition. And now I'm understanding how that, you know, like it's just going to come up anyway, even if you're going with your very best friend or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife or whatever. But um, what was it like for you having such a intense experience, I guess I'll say, with the two, with the same two people, one that you knew quite well, but then I guess Smidge, you've got to know because it had been 10 years of training yeah. for almost 150 days straight. And and I, I'm wondering how that relationship, the relationship dynamics of the three of you evolved and changed. Yeah, it was it was challenging. You know, if you can imagine spending, you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah. with anyone for 148 days, like you're going to get annoyed with people at some point. 
And um, so that, you know, that was a challenge in and of itself. We really had to learn to give each other space when, when we needed it and mm -hmm. um, try not to be too annoying. And it was an interesting dynamic for me. I was sort of um, impressed or happy that Midge was happy to go with Don and I, because it would be easy for us as a couple to mm -hmm. team up against him, you know? So he was kind right. of maybe at a disadvantage in the group dynamics. But so I was like very, trying to be very conscious of this and not side with Don just because he was my boyfriend and try to side with Midge when I thought Midge was right. But mm -hmm. you know, that maybe trying to be hypersensitive to that didn't help because it sometimes made Don feel like I was being unfair to him just in the name of trying to be extra fair. And um, yeah, but, but anyways, I'm kind of getting, I'm kind of derailing myself, but it was, I think the few biggest challenges were that the relationship went back and forth between being a, a team of three of equal members. And that's what we talked about. That's what we wanted to do. You know, Midge was sort of the organizer of the expedition, but Don and I were the leaders when we were out there on the water. But we tried to be a team of three equals in terms of decision making and everything. And that worked most of the time. But every now and then when Midge was extra tired or, or frustrated, he would kind of fall back into the, I'm the client, you guys are the guides relationship. And so uh, switching back and forth between those two roles mm -hmm. was a little bit challenging. And all three of us, Don, Midge and I relate to the world very differently. You know, Midge is a really, really brilliant computer programmer. Um, and Don and I come more from the, uh, we're not brilliant, I'll throw that out there, which is more, uh, common sense, practical, especially in these situations, because we have a lot of experience with South America, with rivers, with all that stuff. And sometimes just those two different ways of looking at the world uh, ca were cause for extra communication to need to be done and try to work things out about how we're relating to our experience, I guess. If that makes sense, I feel like I just rambled a lot and probably didn't yeah. answer your question. But. No, no, I got a lot out of it. I mean, I, and I think it's it was very relatable. Everything that you said, right? It's like, oh, you know, you guys are doing this this wild, crazy, dangerous, intense adventure, but what you were talking about could happen in uh, a mall. You know, it, right? Mm -hmm. It really is very applicable. It, it, it just also made me think, you know, how divided of a world that we live in today and, and you know, people don't trust one another. They're very, very fast to judge. You right. and I were kind of talking about earlier. Based on your experiences on the Amazon, do you have some thoughts or advice on, on how we could learn as a society to come together better for the greater good, for peace? <laughs> Yeah. If you will. I mean, we're all a lot more alike than we think. I mean, that's, that's the thing I always fall back on, including all these people that we met living along the Amazon River. You know, we didn't share a culture. Sometimes we didn't share a same, a similar language. We obviously had very different lifestyles, but if you are willing to take the time to sit down and talk to someone, you realize that, you know, their concerns are very similar to my concerns in terms of, you know, the bigger picture of things. And I think, I think what we've all become, we've all developed this feeling of like, it's me against them. It's us against them. We're so different, <laughs> but it's not true. You know, we're, again, we're much more similar than any of us think. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. Have some really exciting news. Dotsy and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsy and I are always talking about the length of the show, right Dotsy? Yes. <laughs> We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, 
join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. One of the thing that one of the things that I was thinking about in just imagining just the the, the two percent I can even imagine about your journey because I I've uh, guy act once as I mentioned earlier uh, was there had to have been multiple really scary moments really terrifying moments some or many what, t- tell us a couple of 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 those moments and and and, and how you pushed how you pushed through them because mm-hmm. there's a reason that no woman had ever done this before yeah i will i guess i can relate one scary whitewater moment and one scary <clears throat> people moment uh the whitewater one <clears throat> there was 25 days of whitewater on the trip and and then the rest was flat water oh but okay. we were up in the mountains, we started at 15,000 feet in the Andes and went down a river canyon <clears throat> and they were building a new dam in one of the river canyons. And it was really deep. It was maybe 2000 foot deep canyon. And they were doing a bunch of dynamiting to build a road down to the river to start building their dam. So it was really unnatural riverbed. They had blown up uh, you know, rocks as big as school buses <clears throat> that were laying in the middle of the river and a bunch of small rocks, but there was a lot of rapids where the water was going underneath all the rocks and not over it anymore. So, you you know, as a character, you can't run that because you just go underground and not come back. And so we had to look for ways to walk around some of those rapids, but we got to kind of the final end of this canyon and it was a huge rapid, but it was runnable. So we were all making our plan to go down it. And uh, Midge made a mistake at the very top of the rapid and he got stuck in this really big, uh, what we call a hole, which is like a hydraulic where the water's reversing back on itself. And um, Don and I uh, went partway down the rapid and we stopped in a little eddy, which is like a calm spot in the river where you can stop. And we were having this discussion like, okay, we do not know what's around the corner. It could be another unrunnable rapid. If Midge swims out of his kayak, we either rescue him into this eddy right here, or if we're unable to do that, we have to let him go because we were, you know, our thought process was we would maybe die too trying to rescue him. And so we're just having this very, you know, this is happening in a matter of like eight seconds or less that we're having this conversation. And it was just like a very scary moment one watching midge be stuck in this spot and two having this conversation of like if we can't rescue him right here at this spot he might die and we have to be okay with that and um midge got out of the hole in his kayak he didn't he didn't have to swim free of his kayak and he was able to catch the same resting spot that we were so it all worked out okay but we had this moment of you know what flashed through my mind was what am i going to tell his girlfriend how you know we how how are we going to let midge go but that one worked out okay obviously that's terrifying and that's you know like a we were talking earlier about the mental factor of kayaking and it is i mean every single sport has obviously a really big mental component to it and i do think kayaking is a little extra challenging in that regard because maybe as you experienced in your one day of kayaking you know you're in this little plastic boat kind of trapped in it, so to speak. <clears throat> and if you tip over, now you're upside down under the water, trapped in the boat. And it didn't just uh, elicit a lot more fear, I think, than a lot of other sports. <clears throat> but overcoming overcoming the fear, sort of compartmentalizing all the things that could possibly go wrong and still focusing on doing what you need to do is, for me, a really big part of kayaking. And um, I didn't really enjoy it at first, but now the mental aspect is maybe some of the parts that I enjoy the most of kayaking because it's it very much feels like an exercise in mastery over your own mind, you know, your own fears, your not allowing yourself to panic. It's uh, <clears throat> it's really hard to do, but it feels really re- rewarding when you do it right. Yeah, um, you almost have to, I would imagine, really be aware of the feeling of panic and fear and bring your heart rate down so that you can make logical decisions with oxygen in your brain. 
yes to save your life yeah absolutely and you you can see it a lot you know when people are very scared you know maybe they're panicking or maybe they're just really scared you you do not make good decisions when you're really scared no and so yeah it's really learning how to bring that down and <clears throat> calm your mind enough to make the right decision yeah and uh, I guess, you know, one other scary spot, we went through a part of Peru that Peru calls the red zone. And it's just, a, it's a dangerous area for a lot of different reasons. It's a huge drug trafficking area. Like uh, in 2012, this part of Peru became the number one uh, cocaine producing region on the earth. And so there's drug traffickers, there's uh, illegal mm. loggers, there's government people that want to build dams and the indigenous people that are trying to keep all these people out <clears throat> of their territory. And we, um, there had been like three, two people murdered tourists and one guy shot in this area in the few years leading up to our expedition. Oh and so for me, this was the part of the trip that I was the most uh, scared about because to me, you know, river, rivers are kind of the same anywhere you go. And I understand those risks and I'm comfortable with them, but the human factor was uh, like a whole different, whole different uh, set of challenges for me, <clears throat> and so I was really scared about going in there. And we, we got permissions from the indigenous people, basically like telling them what we were doing because they have, for good reason, become very uh, suspicious of all outsiders. Basically, because anyone who comes in there, there really isn't much tourism there. So anyone who's coming in is probably either a drug trafficker or an illegal logger. Those are like the two biggest. So we got permissions explaining what we were doing in the hopes that that would sort of ease their fears about us. And we ended up um, having really good experiences there, but we were there for about a month and we got <clears throat> tons wow. of warnings from people. We heard gunshots um, at night. The Peruvian military had killed a couple of Shining Path leaders like 15 miles away from where we were camped one night. And uh, Shining Path was Peru's <clears throat> sort of, in like the late 1980s and 1990s, Peru sort of had a civil war and the Shining Path started out as like a Maoist insurgency. But they ended up just killing a lot of indigenous <clears throat> poor people, basically. And there's still a bit of Shining Path people left over who mainly are in the drug trade now. But so, like, yeah, we had all these factors of people that we were supposed to be scared of. And <clears throat> it was kind of like a month of not sleeping much for me. Every, you know, every night I felt like I should lay there and try to listen to what was going on. But Everyone we met, especially the indigenous people, were really nice to us and wanted to help us and were super kind. And we made it through, I think, um, half because of precautions that we took and half because we just got lucky. <clears throat> yeah, it sounds like I, I thought you were going to say it was like two days. I, I had no I, I mean, that is a, a extraordinarily long time to be yeah. in that kind of situation and have that kind of fear. And you must have been just absolutely yearning for for real rest because you're yeah. doing this sure <clears throat> every single day <laughs> and you're exhausted and yeah you're sleeping with one eye open yeah. uh for 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 a month uh oh. gosh that 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 part is t i mean i i don't think i could kayak the amazon clearly but um that part of it is something that we don't think about. I mean, I didn't think about any of that when I when I read your story or it's always all the other outside factors right. of a journey like that. Maybe one of the factors why you're the, the first woman, right? When you really start to look into something and the extraordinary dangers of, of, of what you, you guys accomplished, what you did together, the three of you, uh, it, it's just, I, it's just all the more, Wow, yeah, to I, me and impressive. Me, um, six and a half years to write the book. And my mom <clears throat> a couple times was like, Darcy, you need to hurry up with this book writing project. She's like, what if another woman goes and kayaks down the Amazon and writes a book before you do? And I was like, I I'm just not that worried about it, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so I think funny. I got some time. <laughs> that is perfect. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that it was six and a half years. 
because I think I'm on like three or something. It's like, oh yeah, you got plenty of time then. I'm just like I am more like I'm gonna be dead before anything <laughs> else. Oh, that is great. Yeah, it's probably not gonna happen, Mom. It, has it happened? No, no other woman has done it yet. No, okay. no other group has done a source to sea trip since we did ours. We did our trip in 2013. Right. And um, yeah, nobody else has done a full source to sea since then. Unbelievable. So you had a, uh, what you call a two-year-old temper tantrum right in the middle of this 148 day <laughs> event, adventure yes. event. Yes. Uh, <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah, so um, especially when I'm doing talks for groups, I do poke a little bit of fun at Midge and a little bit of fun at Dawn for their uh, character flaws. And my biggest character flaw, especially, I mean, in life and especially for an expedition is I'm pretty impatient and I mm -hmm. want to do things like very much on my time schedule. And I'm not that great at like bending to other people's time schedules, which that's a problem, both when you're in South America, which has a very different time schedule in general than North America, and when you're with two other people on an expedition. And, uh, you know, Midge was always, you know, maybe the physically weakest kayaker of the group, because he wasn't a kayaker when he started, and he's, you know, not much of a natural athlete, I would say, but he, you know, again, he worked really hard, he got himself up to the level to be able to do it. But he would still always say, you know, I'm not a professional kayaker like you guys. I can't kayak that fast. And he he was having like a motivational slump. This was like 110 days into the expedition. And it had gotten to the point where it was really windy. So if we stopped paddling, we would get blown back up the river. And like you just really had to work hard to make any downward progress. And he was feeling a bit unmotivated. And I had been trying for like a couple of weeks of you know, like cheering him up, telling him jokes, getting him to paddle a little bit harder. And then sometimes that would fail and I'd just get really mad and yell at him and be like, you're never going to make it if you don't work harder. And nothing that I did like made any difference whatsoever in his motivation or attitude at that time. And so I had just spent all these days like talking at night instead of sleeping, I'd talk myself into Darcy, who cares how long it takes? This is Midge's trip, just go at his pace. And why do you even care when you finish? You don't have anything to come back to right now. So just who cares? And then <clears throat> I'd wake up and be like, okay, we're going to go slow. It's going to be fine. And then after a couple hours, I'd be like, oh my God, he's not paddling at all. And so, yeah, one day, I don't know why exactly it all came to a head on this day, but I just kind of lost it, like truly like a two-year-old temper tantrum and uh, I was, I'm like pretty uh, emotionally boring. Like I'm not, I don't get really excited. I don't get really bummed out. I'm just like, blah. But anyways, I'm like lift up my paddle and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. And then this uh, trash, uh, like an empty oil, cooking oil bottle floats by. And that made me even more mad because I don't like litter. But I tried to hit the trash with my paddle and I wasn't wearing a spray skirt on the kayak. So I was just sitting there and I reached so far out that I like tipped myself over and fell out. And we're in the flat water, so it's not that big of a deal. But I fell out of my kayak and I had like my Crocs were in there and other stuff. So all this stuff is like floating away. And there I am like swimming around trying to pick up all my stuff again. And I just started laughing. I had this weird like almost out of body experience or I just felt like I was watching myself from above and I'm like god you're such an idiot you're swimming around the Amazon river just because you had a little temper tantrum and I really just started laughing at myself and it was like a whole perspective shift just realizing how stupid I had been and we had like a beautiful amazing sunset that night and it was just like yeah you're on the Amazon river who cares how long you do it and that was right a really, I mean, a hard earned because it was like a lot of many days of angst leading up to it, but a good lesson because nothing about the external circumstances changed after that. You know, Midge kept going slow, but just the way that I thought about where we were and what we were doing and what he was doing, like I was so much more calm about it and I didn't care. And it was a good lesson in 
but a very small uh, change in me it could make a world of difference uh, to how I was experiencing something. Yeah, you just had to kind of acquiesce to this <clears throat> is how this is going to go. Yeah, exactly. Could, I was I was curious about that earlier. It, like, if if you two had just done it without Mitch, would it have been like a fifty day venture? What, what? Um, yeah, not that much faster. So in the whitewater, we kayaked like eight to ten hours a day, and um, okay. yeah, Mitch did really well there and then it was mainly in the flat water that he kind of got a little bit less motivated he only wanted to kayak six hours a day you know and he had a legitimate concern he didn't want to get tendonitis or you know another overuse yeah. injury mm -hmm. but you know if don and i had been by ourselves and kept our own schedule i'm sure we could have cut a month off but you know it's so it still would have been 120 days basically yeah so. yeah okay okay that was interesting to see so the moment when you finally see the open sea in the distance, when you, you, you knew you had succeeded, mm -hmm. what, was that a very euphoric feeling or was it my feeling on the Olympic podium was relief, period, end of story, 100% just relief in that moment. Other feelings came later, but can, mm -hmm. can you take us back to when you saw the open sea and it was like that we did this? Oh, relief is a nice feeling. Okay, so it was it was very cha physically challenging conditions when we were getting to the ocean because there's tides and the wind and we were in like um, racing sea kayaks that were very unstable, but we had like 15 foot tall breaking waves and there was sandbars, so they were coming at different directions. So <clears throat> when we actually, you know, made it to our little... GPS dot that our, was our goal. It was kind of like only focus on survival. And so, you know, we're out there. We didn't even like have time to high five or celebrate because it was so rough that we're just like, okay, we made it. And we were about two miles offshore when we made it. So we made it and we're like, okay, get to shore. And when we actually got to shore, they, it was a really amazing feeling. I would say for about five minutes, you know, really celebratory. We did this. We all had points where we wanted to quit or where we thought we wouldn't make it. And it was like this, yes, we have accomplished this. And we were watching the sunset, but literally after about five minutes, it was like, oh crap, what are we going to do tomorrow? You know, it was like our lives had had such a focused and simple purpose for the last five months. Like, get up have breakfast go kayaking and we had this goal we were all working towards and when that was over I think all of us didn't spend much time thinking about like what's going to be next Don and I were in sort of a different situation because we had just uh, sold our company lost our jobs because I had gotten us fired by the new owner and so we were really like without any anchor or purpose beyond the Amazon so it was this, yeah, really oh. empty feeling of like, all right, now what are we going to do? And that was, uh, that was really interesting to me. Like, I didn't expect that. No, because you didn't think about it. Because right. why would you? Exactly. Right? right. Yeah. I think so many people can relate to that. Mm -hmm. And so you went home, <clears throat> obviously. And is that shortly thereafter or longer thereafter that you formed the company that you have now? We, uh, we had about two years off. So our company is called Small World Adventures. Yeah. And that's the one that we sold. And we in our two years between the Amazon and what came next, we started a new guiding business. But we were about to start running trips in Ecuador again. And we called the guy that bought our business just to let him know and said, a lot of things had changed in his life too. And we said, Hey, by the way, um, do you want to sell the business back? And he said, yes. So we ended up buying our old business back in uh, 2016. And so we've come full circle here. After wow. Amazon vacation in the middle. <laughs> exactly. So that's what y'all do now. So for, for folks who said, Oh my goodness, I'm very intrigued <laughs> after this podcast, how, can they find you and 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 sign up to come adventure with you? Is it is, is, is still in Ecuador? 
Still in Ecuador. Okay. Yeah. So November through March or through the beginning of March, we're in Ecuador. The business is called Small World Adventures. Um, yeah, people can check out the website, follow us on Instagram or Facebook, and yeah, come kayaking in Ecuador. <clears throat> That's just like just extraordinary. I have only been there one time and was in Quito that's 10,000 feet um, and did some cycling there. I was there for a, a different reason to help uh, a, a, a woman open an eating disorder clinic there because they didn't oh. have any, they had zero. Uh, but we, my husband went with me, we did some cycling and uh, it was like some of the hardest terrain I've ever experienced. And the fact that you're at 10,000 feet will get you, yeah. right? <laughs> like, no doubt, like you said, part of your Amazon was experience, experience was at 15,000 feet. Yeah. We all start, that's, that's, that's super legit. Um, yeah. That's another conversation, but um, gosh, I'll, I cannot, I cannot let you go uh, without talking about your compassionate food choices, yes. your food, your diet, which I don't like that word, but you were eating plant-based, vegan, whatever you want to call it, while you were on this adventure, <clears throat> this grand goal of, of, the, of the, the Amazon River. Tell us about the, like your, your meals, your favorite meals. I mean, I, I'm always so in, entranced in like learning what was like your energy meal? What was your nighttime meal? What, what, what did you choose during the day? You know, I know that you probably needed a lot of glycogen, but we all know as athletes, like, you, you know, too much. And then that's, that's a crash. Right. So, so, so take us through a, a, a day of fuel for Darcy it on the Amazon river. Tricky on the Amazon for sure. We, especially in the whitewater, you know, weight is a big factor because we are carrying everything in our right. whitewater kayaks. <clears throat> There's not a lot of room. You don't want them to be really heavy. So we were eating dehydrated meals and, um, at that time, uh, Backpacker's Pantry had like four vegan options. And okay. so I would eat one for breakfast and one for dinner um, every day for 80 days. I, I ate their uh, dehydrated food. What was it? And what's that? What was it? Like, what was the dehydrated food? Was uh, it so one of them was chana masala, which is like okay. rice and garbanzo beans. Mm -hmm. But my favorite one, I don't remember what it's called now, but it um, had little packets of peanut butter in it. It was like a peanut sauce, something. Yay. <clears throat> it had a, a thousand calories, which is like the highest of any meat or plant-based backpackers pantry. So those were great because it was hard to get enough calories with the, you know, and not carry too much food at the same time. So yeah, they had the, that, that one, the peanut sauce, they had Louisiana red beans and rice, which was just what it sounds like, red beans and right. rice. And then uh, mm, Kathmandu curry, which is like a lentil vegetable thing. And so, yeah, it was not a very diverse or exciting diet for the first part, but yeah, I would eat one one for breakfast. I almost always tried to eat the peanut butter one at night to get the thousand calories. <clears throat> and then for lunch, we carried cliff bars. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, once we got further down the Amazon, there was a lot more town so we could get food, but it was still often challenging. There was a lot of rice and beans. Um, I would get extremely excited to find Lay's plain potato chips, the ones that don't have any flavoring, but just the potato and oil. Right. And I would just buy as many bags as I could and like crunch them up and pour them into like the dehydrated lentils just to have like some fat, you know, some oil. <laughs> and a crunch for God's sake with all yeah, the mushy sure. beans and rice. Exactly. So yeah, it was challenging. I I became vegan in 2001 and so had already been vegan for a pretty long time before the expedition. And I was like mm -hmm. a little bit mentally prepared. I'm like, okay, if you're really starving to death, you might have to like eat a fish or something. I was like having this talk with myself before the yeah. expedition, but it, it never came to that. And I'm, you know, I've, I don't know. I, okay. I'm not going to say that. Never mind. I feel very, very strongly about the vegan diet. And it's like of all of my, my moral compass, it's kind of the thing that I will do the most for. And so I have been able to suffer a lot to 
keep being vegan. And there was some days where like all I could eat for a few days was rice or noodles or something, but there was always like something coming or the hope of some food coming. So I was able to stay vegan the whole time. I am just going to have a whole nother experience of just her heart bursting the next time I see Lay's potato chips in a <laughs> convenience store. Like I totally yeah. get that. <laughs> oh, salt, fat, crunch. Exactly. Oh, well, I, I, oh, wow. I commend you so much. And, and most of the people are listening are, are, are right where you are with that moral compass. So uh, they get it and they understand and they're, I'm sure have loads of, of respect you did it when it wasn't easy and when you those days that you thought mm. I'm not going to get enough calories which is dangerous doing an uh, expedition that you all were doing it's 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 a matter between life and death you know if you um get to if you don't have enough calories and you get too lightheaded you know it's right. that's that's scary so I commend that what's the next adventure for Darcy well yeah for a while it was writing the book and that was a really challenging adventure for me because it was way, very outside of my wheelhouse. You know, I didn't even know what a literary agent was when I started, so I had to learn a lot. And um, that one's done now. So Don and I, we really like the, the source to see idea. To get to see a river or know a river from the beginning to the end was yeah. very cool. But we are both much more whitewater kayakers than flatwater kayakers. So there's three rivers in northern British Columbia that all start on a place called the Sacred Headwaters Plateau, and they're all pretty hard rivers. They all have some flat water, but, you know, majority white water, and they're about three to 400 miles each. So shorter, not as big of a commitment, but we want to go up there um, in 2024 because we've sort of cleared our calendar of work commitments for the season that those rivers run and do source to sea on those three rivers. Okay. Before well, we get too old, you know. Oh, no, please. <laughs> Will you come back on after yeah. you do all of that in British yeah. Columbia? It's one of the most exquisite places on planet Earth, isn't it? To, to, mm -hmm. to, yeah, to, I love uh, it. To do anything. Wow. Well, you are such a joy. And I, I just, I'm just still like goose pimples just thinking about all that y'all went through and what you've accomplished. And everybody, go get the book. It's amazing. And uh, I think they're going to, this was a great teaser for everyone going to buy your book <laughs> to, to be able to hear from you. Yeah, Amazon woman facing fears, chasing dreams. Uh, thank you so much. Alexandra's going to be so sad she missed this one. Well, thanks for having me on. And thank you for being an inspiration too and all that you've created with this organization. Oh, well, you're sweet. All right. Until next time after British Columbia, yes. I bid you adieu. Thank you. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>